break this down. First off, some things that you want to realize. When you go to uh, buy real estate, you need to make sure that the money in your account, if you are going to leverage that money in the form of getting a mortgage or a, a loan, you need to have that money quote unquote seasoned. Well, what is seasoned? It's not like taking salt and pepper and just going, hey, this stuff's gonna be delicious. I'll put enough salt and pepper on it. No, the point is, is that you have to have your down payment or all of the money that you're gonna be using uh, to qualify for a mortgage for the real estate in your bank account for a certain amount. All right, I often get the question asked, uh, who are your sources? Uh, where are you getting your sources from? And uh, most of the time, it's somebody that, uh, it, well, they're just being belligerent. They don't, uh, they don't believe anything that I'm saying, and which is fine. You always uh, don't have to take what I say. Uh, and a lot of times, I don't give you my sources. But I did want to make a kind of a montage of, of the best of the best uh, YouTube creators that I use uh, to get a lot of my information from. Uh, and then I'll try to put my own commentary on these because there's things in their videos that they don't talk about um, that, that I learned on my own. Or, and of course, I learned from them. And this is one of the greatest uh, videos by the Economic Ninja. You definitely want to check out his channel. Uh, a lot of times he's just reading from the news, but uh, he does give his own commentary on it. And uh, evidently he's made a lot of money, a lot more than I ever will. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, this was, uh, I was curious, you know, because I've got plans. I mean, I've been, I've been buying uh, gold, silver, platinum for, for many years, uh, trying to store it in various places, keep it safe. But I've never really had a good plan uh, for how I was going to sell it if stuff hits the fan. Let's just put it that way. And so, you know, I've kind of got, you know, vague notions in my mind. And he put together this video, and I thought this was very important. And I'm just going to take probably a couple minutes of this video. He's got hundreds and hundreds of videos, so it's not like I'm borrowing a tremendous amount of his content. And then I want to add to this because there's some things he doesn't talk about here that, that you're going to want to consider when you do uh, go to sell your, your precious metals or, or any other assets that you may have uh, to convert those into other assets because... You know, and, and by the way, he, he doesn't say it here, but in a lot of his videos, and I, I definitely agree, is that we will have a real estate crash and houses are going to come on the market, uh, property, uh, real estate in general, commercial property. You're going to be able to get that for pennies on the dollar, uh, probably within about the next year or so, maybe less. And so you're going to be wanting to take these assets that you have, whatever they may be. Uh, you know, but could be uh, palladium, you know, I don't know, whatever you got, lithium, maybe you got lithium, who knows, but these are things that you're going to want to convert, and this is how you're going to have to do it. Here we go. For people that are wanting to buy real estate and wanting to take the appreciation of their gold and silver in dollar terms and convert that to real estate during the next cycle, it's a very important thing. So let's break this down. First off, some things that you want to realize. When you go to uh, buy real estate, you need to make sure that the money in your account, if you are going to leverage that money in the form of getting a mortgage or a, a loan, you need to have that money quote unquote seasoned. Well, what is seasoned? It's not like taking salt and pepper and just going, hey, this stuff's gonna be delicious. I'll put enough salt and pepper on it. No, the point is, is that you have to have your down payment or all of the money that you're gonna be using uh, to qualify for a mortgage for the real estate in your bank account for a certain amount of months. And as banking uh, lending gets tighter, they actually extend that amount of time. Currently, you need your money seasoned for about two to three months for the underwriter of the bank to be able to view it and say, okay, that's your money, it's been in your account for a while. So when you're considering selling your gold and silver to start buying real estate, do that. You need to have it done ahead of time. You can't turn around, find a deal in one day and go, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get it under contract and then if you need to get a mortgage, I'm gonna go sell my gold and silver, that won't work because the bank will not allow it. Why? Because they wanna make sure that it was your money in the first place and it can be very, very difficult. So understand that. If you know that you're getting into the time where you wanna start looking for deals in real estate and you're gonna be using 
funds from your physical gold and silver holdings, you want to start selling them little by little and depositing them in the bank account. Now, with that being said, you also want to make sure that you have a paper trail. Why? Because as you start putting lumps of money into your bank account, the regulators are going to ask, what the heck's going on? They're going to make sure that you're not laundering money or dealing drugs or any of that kind of stuff. So it's very, very important that you have a paperwork trail. Now, with that being said, there are so many different laws out there, both state laws and federal laws, in regards to taxing uh, precious metal sales. And so what's very, very important is to know your own state laws. That's not what this video is about, but what I do suggest is that you keep a good paperwork trail. And what you need is what's called a cost basis. That is the price you paid for the metal. Either you wrote it down in a ledger or you have a receipt for that, okay? So again, not all bullion or coin sales are taxable. You wanna find out it comes down to the type of bullion and coin. It also comes down to the amount that you sell in a given time period, okay? So now that's done, you've got your paperwork trail for the sale of your metal, then you're going to take it and you're going to deposit the cash. Now, when you go to sell it, there's two different ways to sell it. You can either sell it to an online dealer, which you tend to get more per ounce from online dealers and it's very easy to shop on. Okay, so that's all I wanna borrow from his video right there. And he goes into to selling, and I want to talk about my slant on selling. Okay, uh, so if you do sell to an online dealer, all right, you're going to have to go to the post office and you're going to put, put down an insurance policy on that uh, amount of silver or gold. And, and you're going to have to do it in small increments. You're not going to go down and dump, you know, a, a, a monster box on that. On the post office and and send it to uh, let's say SD Bullion, which is one of the online dealers that I use. Okay, uh, they usually have very good prices, and there's a lot of good information on their website if you want to learn about selling. They've got their own uh, uh, bullet list on how to sell silver, and I'm going to get into a little bit more on that in just a minute. So that's one way. The other way is go to your local coin shops, and uh, I'm not much of a haggler. Now, if you watch the Economic Ninja, he'll, he'll tell you, you know, you walk into the coin shop, you ask them, you know, how much will you give me for, for you know, I've got, you know, let's say a, a sleeve of um, and a Philharmonics. Okay, so I bought I bought 20 of them, you know, and that's, you know, it was only five, 500 bucks or so, uh, because, but they were offering them at three, $3 and some odd cents over spot, which was a really good price when you consider that uh, Britannica's went, well, I think it was Britannica's, they went all the way up to $7 over spot. And so I was like, you know, and it was a, a three-day deal. There's, you know, and that's what, it's, I always keep an eye on SD Bullion and sometimes, and most of the time I don't have the cash. I can't, I can't jump on anything, but, you know, it, it once a month, you know, usually I have a little bit of extra uh, coinage and, and maybe I can jump on a deal like that. Yeah, that's just buying. But anyway, so selling, uh, you got to pay all of that shipping cost to get it to the to the online dealer, and a lot of times, you know, they they're offering you a pretty decent price over spot, uh, you know, depending on the premiums, uh, but they got to make a profit. So if you bought it at seven dollars over spot, uh, they'll buy it back for three fifty over spot, for example, you know, and that's that's not a bad price. And so I've been to a couple of local shops, and like I said, I'm not a haggler, but what. What the ninja says is you go in and you say, look, I got this. They say, uh, like I went to one coin shop and they said, well, we'll give you 10% below spot. Well, I know that the premiums right now are $8 over spot. I'm like, that's just, and so I just walked right out the door. Now, what he would do is he'd say, you know, well, I got these. And if you do get a customer and you want these, uh, you know, I'll give them to you for uh, $2 over spot. I uh, said, so here's my card. Here's my phone number. Um, you know, if, if, if you decide you want that deal, because if they get a customer and they can sell it for $7 over spot, they might call you up and say, hey, bring your silver in and we'll give you the $2 over spot, especially if you've got a relationship with that coin shop. And then that saves you all of the money from having to uh, ship that money or ship those coins to, to an online dealer. But the, the point here was, okay, so... All of this money, because you're converting it from hard assets into fiat currency. And you're like, why would you ever want to do that? Well, you got to have the fiat currency 
to buy the house or the real estate or whatever because they're you can't just walk in and say hey you know here's my silver give me your house you might be able to <laughs> depending on where things go but i doubt it and so what he was saying is you got to have your paper trail every time i buy anything i have a spreadsheet and i put the amount that i paid for it and then of course i also keep a running number of, of um, what it's worth at spot and then I, I'll add, you know, a lot of times just a premium amount to that of what I think I could probably sell it for, like $3 over spot or $2 over spot. And that way I kind of keep a running total of, of what I have in hard assets. And so that's kind of my, my ledger. Uh, and then, of course, also, you know, I, I keep the receipts, you know, whenever I get them. A lot of them are just online receipts, but I, I put the receipts in a folder and so I've got the receipts. So... If I ever do convert my gold and silver uh, and hard assets into fiat currency so that I can make some moves, like I said, you got to season it. You got to leave it there for 60 days. You know, suddenly, you know, $50,000 pops up in your account. Where did it come from? This is unusual. It's unusual activity. Anything over 10000 is getting flagged. And they brought the, They were talking about anything over $600 was going to get flagged. And that's why I love this video. And so this is my first source. is the Economic Ninja. If I'm going to try to go through each of my sources, this is going to be a long video. But that's it for... Uh, this was the greatest information that I got from him recently. Now, he does throw out ticker symbols. Uh, he's, he's bought into a lithium... Uh, stock. I'll, I'll give you that on the next clip. Package up your metal and what I would suggest doing is not doing it all at once and doing it in small quantities to build a relationship with that dealer. You also want to make sure that that package is insured for the amount. I have literally had a lot of precious metal stolen and literally it was insured, thank heavens, and it took a long time to get the insurance money uh, to us. But my point is it wasn't. All right, so that, that's a real good point. And because uh, it might take you a while, even though it's insured, you know, you, you're dealing with Uncle Sam. Who knows when you'll get your money or not, even with the insurance. So the, uh, the, there was two other things that I wanted to point out with, with uh, precious metals or lithium or whatever you got, palladium. Is uh, one of the things that I want to do is, you know, the historic ratio. And you probably, if you watch any YouTube, you know what the ratio is between gold and silver and the historic ratios it could be 7 to 1, 15 to 1, uh, 30 to 1. Right now, you know, silver, uh, I don't know what it is at the moment. It's been as high as 90 uh, to 1. And what that means is like, you know, one silver coin, uh, you know, gold's worth 90 times more, which is kind of uh, inflated. And so one of the thoughts that I've always had is if that ratio comes way down and let's say that uh, 15 silver uh, coins can be converted into one gold coin, just for example, 15 ounces of silver. That's what I was thinking that I was going to do. Or right? if I don't need to convert it into other assets like real estate, like we were talking about seasoning the money and I'm. I could send in that silver to the online dealer and just convert it into gold and then have them send the gold back. Uh, because then that ratio might change the other way. And then, of course, now now all of a sudden, one gold coin is worth uh, 30 silver coins, and then you convert it back the other way. So you're going to play that conversion game. And that's that's one one strategy that I wanted to use. The other one is what happens when you die? And there was a video, uh, I'm going to try to find it. It was called the four D's about why people sell uh, their silver um, or their gold or their precious metals. You know, the first would be um, uh, divorce. That's by a lot of uh, divorces you're going to go through and have to liquidate your, your precious metals. Uh, you know, I've heard horror stories where the wife, uh, uh, and of course, the next one is death. Okay, what do you do when you die? Um, I can't remember, uh, debt, debt was the other. So that's three of the D's. So let's say, okay, death, what, what's going to happen? Well, I got nobody. I don't have any relatives or anybody that I trust my state to, but a lawyer, I have hired a law firm and what they will do. And I've also negotiated with SD Bullion. SD Bullion is based out of Michigan. And it turns out my lawyer has, uh, a, a, a cabin up in Michigan and he goes up there on a regular basis 
And so I, I told him, I said, well, when I die, yeah, I've got a foundation set up, a charitable foundation. And so he's going to, and I talked to SD Bullion. SD Bullion, they don't deal uh, in person, okay? The, everything's supposed to be done by through the mail, except in very large quantities. And so in in this case, my, my lawyer would be getting all of my, my safety deposit boxes. He would be getting everything and combining it into one, you know, one massive uh, shipment. And he would drive it up personally to SD Bullion and then they would convert that into fiat currency. And then that fiat currency would go to my foundation. And I've made all of these arrangements. They're all in writing and they're all locked in concrete. So these are things that you do need to think about. So what's going to happen to your precious metals when you die? Okay, I fell down the stairs and broke my neck. It's supposed to be dead. I still have no feeling in my hands or my feet because I've got neuropathy from breaking my neck, but I can walk. So, you know, God, God works in mysterious ways. So anyway, these are things to think about. All right, so let's get on to uh, the next uh, clip. This will have to probably be a series of videos as I go through my sources and talk about it. All right, so I wanted to get on to my second source, but before I do, one last uh, addition to the selling of precious metals and converting it into other assets is I do watch a lot of, uh, there's all kinds of uh, channels, uh, and uh, like Yankee Stacking, uh, there's a couple of those, uh, and, and you'll see uh, various coin shops around the country that quote different prices. And so there was actually a coin shop up in uh, Michigan. I think I want to say it was Grand Rapids. And I didn't recognize, I was just watching uh, this, this video. It was not somebody I watch on a regular basis. And that uh, coin shop was offering two twenty five dollars above spot for silver. That's the best price that I've heard a coin shop. We're quoting it right off of the bat. Uh, like I said, the one here wanted 10% below spot. So that's, that's just, uh, so that's why I'm saying you got to shop around at all the coin shops. And, uh, you know, it, it might be worth a drive, you know. Maybe you want to go up and visit northern Michigan and you could go into that coin shop and get your 225 especially if you got a quantity that you want to sell. And that's the beauty of a coin shop is, you know, you, it's not like you're, you've got that traceability of sending it through the mail and all of the uh, risk that you're going to take with that. So let's get to Judge, this is Judge Napolitano. Napolitano. All right, and uh, he interviews all uh, kinds of different guests. Some, some of them I agree with, some of them I don't. Uh, this is one of the greatest videos uh, here recently. I highly encourage you to watch his channel. Uh, and because he gets on uh, really uh, interesting people. But this, this was uh, just one here recently, and I, I, boy, I love this guy. Watch this. Welcome to the program, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Sure. So set the scene for us. You um, are not a student at Columbia, but you were invited to some sort of a public event. Well, what was the event? Who was on the stage? And, and what was going on there at Columbia? Yeah, so it was an event hosted by the Columbia School of Journalism. And this was an event that was um, being uh, hosted by some of the biggest names in media, mainstream press today. The executive editor of the New York Times, the executive editor of the LA Times, the executive editor for Washington Post and for Reuters, right? So they're all up on stage, and even Barack Obama gave a message to this conference. So it was a pretty big, big deal. The press, the when you say that the the Western media journalists, that is who was there. Okay, and you were in the audience. I was in the audience. Yeah. And what what was the purpose of the gathering to to, to bemoan the? All right, so I'm going to skip all the commentary, and I want to get up to where he does his thing. So I'm going to uh, cut the video off right here, and we'll go to the next clip. All right, so I watched the, the, the video up to this point, and, and basically what it was was he waited about 10 minutes into the conference, and all of these, these uh, media bigwigs are up there discussing how they're going to uh, eliminate uh, misinformation and disinformation uh, from the American people because, uh, you know, obviously we need to uh, uh, censor, you know, these independent reporters, you know, censor YouTube, censor uh, uh, anything that, uh, that they don't approve of. And so he just jumped up. Uh, he didn't have a microphone or anything. Uh, they had pre-written questions. That was the only way you could get to ask a question 
uh, kind of like uh, when you're going to ask Biden a question, be sure that uh, he's got it ahead of time. Um, so here you go. This is this was this was a precious moment. We're going to play your A plus two dot zero harangue, and and then we'll unpack it. Okay, Gary, let's play it. Shouldn't we be talking about the Nord Stream since that's the biggest story of the century? And you guys, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, you have the executive editor of the New York Times there who came out with a phony story to try and block Seymour Hersh. It just, all of you are executive editors of papers that broke Pentagon, Me Lie, Watergate. Is this the same papers or not? I mean, is there anything you've gotten right in the last 20 years? Or am I mistaken about that? Iraq, wrong. Syria, wrong. Russiagate, really wrong. Okay, I mean, the list goes on and on. So, will you at least say something, either about Nord Stream or Ukraine, or the fact that Zelensky brought us to the verge of World War III, and the only reason we knew about that was through leaks? I'm, go ahead, it's a free speech event, right? You guys are the press. Well, I just want to hear what they have to say. Go ahead, I'm done. They actually tackle him and throw him to... Another source that I use is the Duran. These are probably the two greatest, um, what do they call them, geopolitic uh, people. Um, and how in the world, I mean, I, it seems to me they got a staff in the background because... Not only does Alexander Mayorkas, he's at the bottom there, have his own channel, uh, he gets with uh, Alex Kristoff, and they do commentary together. And, of course, you know, they do in individual uh, stuff, and this is posted on the Duran. Now, the thing I like about the Duran is it's posted on Rumble, and you are actually watching Rumble at this point. I tried to watch this interview. In fact, I did watch this interview on YouTube. And I'm going to tell you, I guess there must be some sort of setting. I don't... You, Put commercials on my channel um, for for reasons because <laughs> I don't want to get sued. I watch this on Rumble because the commercials this this particular video. I mean, the commercial came on every two minutes, man. It was unbelievable. You couldn't even watch it. It was, but on Rumble it doesn't have commercials. Plus, I want to support Rumble anyway. And this was a recent interview. This is uh, you know Alex is not here, but Alexander is, and. Um, this is uh, an ambassador, and so I want you to, I'm going to kind of skip through this video because I want you to understand the background of Russia and Ukraine and how everything came about. And this was probably, this this guy, uh, he was there from the very beginning, and he walks you through the whole thing. And so it's going to it's gonna be a tough for me to cut this up properly, but let's get started from 1993. Military operations and support of Peacekeeping or disaster relief are not fundamentally different from those involved in warfare. And so um, that was the idea. Uh, that fell afoul of two things uh, domestic American electoral politics, with uh, ethnic groups NATO. insisting on uh, the immediate admission of their favorite country, their, home, their ancestral homeland, to NATO without regard to their conditions. Uh, and uh, and second, uh, uh, revanchism, in fact, uh, a kind of uh, triumphalism on the part of neoconservatives in the United States and their fellow travelers in Europe, mm -hmm. um, which altered the plan. With respect to Ukraine, the idea originally was, uh, well, there were two uncertainties. One was, would the Baltics join NATO? And the answer there that we had when we came up with this idea was, if Russia does not object, yes. If it is acceptable to Russia, yes. And in fact, it did prove acceptable to Russia. Uh, with Ukraine, we had a different calculation. We imagined Ukraine would wish to learn the Stanags to become militarily interoperable with NATO, but would not seek to join NATO because that would be a strategic provocation that would bring in a Russian intervention. So we understood, this is 1993, this is 30 years ago, we understood very well um, what would happen if, if Ukraine were admitted uh, to NATO, especially if it failed to meet any of the criteria of that. 
Um, okay, the interview goes on from there. So I'm going to start skipping through. It's two hours long, <laughs> so I have to watch this to get to the parts that I want you to see. So that was back in 1993. And even back then, uh, well, what he was talking about early on in the video was that NATO was meant to be just a defensive um, uh, organization. They were never meant for offense. Uh, and that, that he, he briefly talked about in that clip uh, how it was evolving into something that it was not meant to be uh, and that Russia uh, never wanted it to be. But Russia was, was going along with the whole NATO thing at first, and then things changed. And I'll get you on the next clip, uh, bring you up to uh, more recent. All right, so up until this point, he's, he's bringing us up to, to, to date, and he talked about, you know, when Russia was massing the forces along the side and, uh, and how we stiff-armed Russia uh, basically into invading Ukraine, uh, if you want to look at it that way, uh, because uh, Russia was looking to negotiate, and I'll let him let you hear his words on it. ...which had ultimate tragic consequences for the Tsar and his regime. And so how did we get here? We got here through a series of blunders, misjudgments, uh, all, none of which should have happened. There should have been talks with the Russians. If you sit down at the table to talk to someone, as I know from my diplomatic experience, that you are not necessarily there to agree with them or to accept what they're proposing. But at least you listen uh, and you try to understand their position. You exercise a bit of empathy um, and you try to figure out how you can square the differences between you in a way that um, leaves both sides better off than they were uh, before. We did none of that. And I have to say, in criticizing my own country's diplomatic style at the moment, it does not appear that we know how to do that. Uh, I look at the disastrous encounter between Secretary of State Blinken and National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, in Anchorage with the Chinese at the outset of the administrative Biden administration. I look at the uh, botched effort to uh, restore restraints on Iranian nuclear programs. I look at the absence of dialogue with North Korea, which is where maximum pressure policy has produced an ICBM with a nuclear warhead capable of striking our homeland, uh, the American homeland. So uh, I'm not impressed by uh, how we got to this point. That's kind of his assessment of our diplomatic uh, prowess here in the United States. So now we get into Alexander's uh, interpretation of what he just heard. Uh, you know, there's uh, Jordan Peterson, you've got um, Robert Barnes. I mean, there are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people on YouTube. And Alexander is one of those. Just listen to him speak. It's amazing. It seems to me, Ambassador, that what you are saying is a, a, a collapse of diplomacy and the need for a return to one, because there hasn't been much in the way of diplomacy for some time. But now, perhaps the situation on the ground in Ukraine and the situation with the sanctions might finally persuade people that diplomacy, which I think has almost been treated as something something akin to appeasement, that if you are talking to the other side, doing what you said, so in some kind of empathy towards them, you are you are appeasing evil in some fashion. I mean, that's the kind of rhetoric that I personally am encountering all the time when I say, you know, we need, we need to some, look for some kind of way out, some kind of interactions. People always bring up this appeasement issue. But that's what we need to get through to. And, um, I mean, you've spoken with the Russians, you've had dealings with the Russians, you've spoken with Ukrainians, you've spoken with all of these people. And I think that this rhetoric of evil, of black and white, and all of those things that we managed to trap ourselves into has done an enormous amount of harm. But it is going to be very, very difficult to get some of our electorates now now that they've been hearing all of this for so long 
to suddenly change uh, uh, their mood and to turn around and say, well, perhaps we, you know, you're telling us one day we can't talk to Putin, he's evil. Why are we therefore talking to him now? It's going to be very difficult to do that. So I skipped forward in the video, and this pretty much sums up the conflict in Ukraine, which I hope that this helps you understand. We have no business being in Ukraine. It has nothing to do with the United States. It's not in our national security interest. But I thought that this this sums it all up. This will this will give you the background because I'm like you. I didn't really know anything about what was going on in between Ukraine and Russia for the last what since 2014 when when the coup took place until today. It just uh, and it's and it really has nothing to do with us. Diplomatic point of view, um, there are four issues here to be resolved. Um, and the question of the U.S.-Russian proxy war, which is one of them, um, is perhaps the easiest to solve. The most difficult one is the war between Ukrainians, uh, because people forget that this began as a civil war between Ukrainians who insisted on uh, that Russian-speaking Ukrainians speak only Ukrainian for official purposes and educate the children in Ukrainian. Um, and this fissure between uh, Ukrainian tourists and Russian-speaking Ukrainians was in evidence um, right after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the efforts of the Crimea to declare independence uh, from Ukraine and uh, to become a, um, a, a, a constituency of the Russian Federation. And it certainly was in evidence in 2014 with the reaction to the uh, coup in, in Kiev. Um, so this is a fundamental problem. It was, however... Let me put that in perspective. Suppose right now we said that all Spanish speakers in the United States must speak English or else you go to jail. There you go. Uh, quite skillfully, on a theoretical level, at Minsk in the two agreements. But it is very significant that Russia accepted that despite its... Now, Mintz, background there, Angela Merkel said that that was just a, uh, well, it wasn't even a treaty. It was something to fool the Russians and to give in the United States and NATO time to arm Ukraine since 2014. That with the uh, NATO and the United States never, ever meant to honor the Minsk agreement, even though Russia thought that we would. It's fellow Russian speakers in Ukraine. Uh, a federal structure in Ukraine that would give them, let's say, the rights of the Quebecois in Canada, uh, French-speaking Canadians, um, uh, or uh, Swiss Canton, or uh, Walloons versus uh, 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 others in Belgium. Um, you know, this that this would be acceptable, um, and it was a separate issue from the question of what of where Ukraine fit in European security architecture. But this, problem, this issue of how to compose differences among Ukrainians has become ever more complicated. Um, people in the Russian-speaking areas in Ukraine have been subjected to uh, almost a decade of bombardment and um, uh, the, the, the level of blood that's been sh shed on both sides now uh, has embittered things to such a level that we hear people in Kyiv saying that when and if, when, they never say if, they liberate the Donbass, etc. They plan to hold trials to, for treason of anyone who collaborated with the Russians. Um, and they, um, they insist that uh, they will impose a Ukrainian language on the public. See, the Minsk agreements were meant to end the Ukrainian civil war, and it did not. And the Donbass region has been begging Russia uh, to intervene on their behalf for many years now. So, uh, well, and then Russia, through the Minsk agreements, thought they had solved that. But Ukraine continued to bomb the Donbass region uh, with artillery. So just give, trying to give you the background here so that you can understand how this all came about. Well, you couldn't find a more effective way of preventing any kind of deal than that. 
What's in it for the Russian-speaking Ukrainians who agree to be tried for treason or to um, give up the uh, language rights that they uh, first uh, asserted in their secession? So that's one thing. There are four wars. That's the first. The second is one between the Russian state and um, I'm sorry about that. Russian state and the Ukrainian state, um, and um, uh, there we have uh, you know an, an unwillingness to talk on both sides. Um, but Mr. Zelensky says essentially that there must be regime change in Moscow before he will negotiate with Russia, uh, which is again uh, an instance of a complete uh, failure. Uh, to lay the basis for any sort of negotiation. The third war is uh, the proxy war between the U.S. and Russia, and we could call that off. Um, that, you know, I, we, I'm speaking of the United States, we could call that off. Although you're quite right, the level of war propaganda and indoctrination that we've all suffered, and the degree of passion that has become invested in this issue, are such that it would be require extraordinary leadership on the part of our president and uh, uh, senior members of our legislature, and I don't see it. Uh, so I'm sorry to say I don't see it in the UK either. Um, the, um, and the final war, of course, is uh, the one between uh, Europeans about how to organize a stable peace in Europe. Um, this is NATO versus Russia, I suppose, um, NATO now including Finland, um, uh, and uh, potentially including Sweden as well. Uh, so that in instead of uniting Europe in a cooperative security arrangement as the partnership for peace envisaged, Europe is being united in a collective security organization directed at Russia. And just as we see elsewhere, if Mexico and Canada had uh, joined NATO, which is Finland. Finland borders, uh, he has a huge border with Russia. And then, of course, we were going to bring Ukraine into the NATO alliance. I would imagine, wouldn't you feel a little threatened if uh, the, the Canada and Mexico joined the Russian Federation? I think so. So that's it for the Duran. This is, a, like I said, this is just another channel that I watched, and I thought this was one of the the best recent videos because it really gave you the background on what's been taking place in Ukraine over the years, what, how diplomacy has failed completely under the Biden administration, and that'll be it for until I get to the next creator that I want to show you. So this is the Hindustan Times. I assume this is out of India. I don't really know. I mean, I guess I should uh, Google it. Go Google it. But anyway, they uh, they put up a lot of uh, uh, short clips with, uh, and this is where I get a lot of my headlines from. And uh, I, I enjoy watching these. Most of the time, they're just put to the same music, and then they just give you a commentary. I'm just going to give you the first part of this. So, you know, when you read the title, Russia launches massive air, land, and sea attacks on Ukraine. And then it always uh, gets into like this. This is what it what it is, and we'll just do this briefly. I mean, because there, there's just too many of these to even, well, here, let's just show you. I mean, they put up uh, Erdogan's last ditch effort to retain power. Um, Russia under attack, train power line blows up in two provinces. I don't know how they get all their news, but they're right on top of everything most of the time. And uh, and so this is, this is, I always peruse these just like I do the Russia Ukraine updates. So let's just watch two seconds of this. I love the name. Wellness look like for your vagina. Oh, mm, not that. Introducing Love Sorry, Wellness, the new approach to vaginal health. With I got to sit through the doggone video. Sorry about that. Well, I'll edit this out. Copyright, but uh, so yeah, and, and it's always kind of that music, and then you can just read the uh, the commentary on the bottom. 
So that's another creator that I highly encourage you to watch. Uh, we're going to be tying off this video. Um, I think I'll just continue this series to show you uh, a lot of the, the, the different talent that's that's available on YouTube and, and Rumble. You know, on Rumble, you well, we'll get we'll get there. There are a lot of uh, creators on Rumble now that have been banned from YouTube, and uh, those are always good to get uh, information from. And I'll try to let you know when, because I don't. I'm, in Dustin times, if they're on Rumble, I've I've never found them, because uh, then you can avoid the commercials. Uh, they probably are. I I just uh, I, I there's there's a few, of course, that have been completely banned uh, from from YouTube. All right, let's keep going. So it's time to finish off today's video. We'll continue uh, to get to all of my sources. Uh, let's uh, let's watch uh, the Republicans. They're all in on uh, let's destroy Russia and Ukraine. Vyacheslav Tartakovsky, Ria Novosti, Russia. Uh, we know that uh, you don't support uh, the current unlimited and uh, uncontrolled uh, supplies of weaponry and aid to Ukraine. So, can you comment, is it possible if in the near future uh, the U.S. policy regarding sending weaponry to Ukraine will change? Yeah, I'm not sure. The, the, the sound here is not good. Did he say, I don't support aid to Ukraine? No, I vote for aid for Ukraine. I support aid for Ukraine. I do not support what your country has done you do, to Ukraine. I do not support your killing of the children either. And I think for one standpoint, you should pull out. And I don't think it's right. And we will continue to support because the rest of the world sees it just as it is. So as the United States goes bankrupt and our fifth bank, well, not our fifth bank, but the fifth bank, major bank has failed uh, because we are bankrupt in our nations. Uh, we have sent over $151 billion to Ukraine, uh, more than the cost of the entire uh, 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 Afghan war. Uh, these warmongering uh, Democrats and Republicans, they continue to uh, do the best they can. Let's get to the Moscow preparations for Victory Day. I thought this was very interesting. You know, I did not, I mean, I, I knew that Russia had a lot of women in uniform. Uh, and of course, we had the women Marines when I was at uh, Paris Island. But I thought this was very impressive because they're getting ready for the Victory Day Parade. By the way, if you don't know what the Victory Day Parade is, is that uh, Russia, I think this is a celebration of when they won World War II, I tell you. It's hard to keep track of all these things, but let's watch this. This is very impressive. All the men contribute to the Russian women. I tell you what, I wouldn't want to face these women on the battlefield. That's just my opinion. Perfect. Watch them. March by. All right, so that's it for today's uh, video. Uh, I'll get to some more uh, YouTube creators, um, Rumble creators that I listen to that you might want to uh, participate in as we prepare for the upcoming apocalypse that's about to happen or is happening actually before our eyes. Uh, by the way, uh, I found out today don't take uh, chicken wire out your $10,000 new front door, it will uh, tear the plastic up. Uh, and uh, I am just very upset about that. Peace out. Stay free. Good, good, good to live in the free, free, free Republican state of Florida under the great leadership of Governor DeSanctimonious.